The images of mushroom clouds have become indelibly linked with the power and terror of nuclear weapons. Yet beyond the disturbing imagery lies a somber and often untold story, the fate of the bodies of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In the aftermath of the bombings, the survivors, known as Hibakusha, faced an unimaginable reality. The level of destruction surprised and concerned even those who dropped the bomb. Tens of thousands died from the blast, primarily civilians, while more would die in the ensuing months. The cities were transformed into landscapes of ruin, but it was the human cost that was most harrowing. The treatment of the dead, the efforts to identify and honor the thousands of victims and the long-term impact on those who were left to mourn in a radically altered world, are chapters rarely explored in depth. The history of war can be split into two distinct periods, war before the atomic bomb and war after. The world's first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, and the destruction would shock even those who designed the weapon. Roughly 45,000 to 75,000 died from the blast, while similar numbers again would succumb to their injuries within the next few months. Many cities were bombed into oblivion during the war, but what makes Hiroshima and Nagasaki special is that they were both obliterated with a single bomb. These two bombs, named Little Boy and Fat Man, were the first atomic weapons ever used in action. The two cities had been largely untouched throughout the war, and that is why they were chosen specifically, so the effects of these new weapons could be accurately observed. Early in the morning of August 6, 1945, the American bomber Enola Gay dropped Little Boy, which exploded just above the city with the force of 15,000 tons of TNT. The city was engulfed in light and then plunged into darkness. Over half the city was destroyed and tens of thousands were dead. Three days later, Fat Man was dropped on Nagasaki. This detonated with the force of 21,000 tons of TNT, but the bomb detonated above a valley, shielding much of the city. Another American plane, Big Stink, saw the explosion from over 100 miles away. The weeks and months that followed were some of Japan's darkest days. The total death toll is debated. Imprecise record keeping, the destruction of records and the presence of undocumented foreign workers means there is significant variation in estimates. The lowest figures cited are 129,000, while others are as high as 226,000. The Explosion Thousands died in the explosion, vaporized in a flash of light. The heat was so intense that a man sat on a step had his shadow etched into the stone he was sitting on. His body was quickly disintegrated, melted down layer by layer until all that was left was his charred skeleton. Tens of thousands died in this way. Their flesh and organs melted in an instant, like wax dripping off a candle. The lucky ones were those at the epicenter, for whom everything would have merely turned black. Those in the outer reaches of the fatal zone faced unimaginable pain. Many were burned to death from the intense heat, with 50% of the initial deaths being from nuclear flash burning. Many had their eyeballs melt down their face or their mouths closed shut with blisters. The blast set much of the city on fire, with the shock wave causing a firestorm to spread through the city. Many people were trapped in the rubble of collapsed buildings, unable to escape the fire. The blast launched dust and debris high into the air and seeded the cloud with black rain, falling around an hour after the explosion. This toxic rain, almost as thick as tar, was infused with dust and nuclear fallout. In some cases, contact with this rain caused severe radiation burns. Almost no survivors of Hiroshima report hearing an explosion or any noise from the bomb at all. Those far enough away had but a few seconds to seek cover after viewing the initial blast of light. Following the explosion, one young girl wandering the streets of Hiroshima alone came across a group of Japanese soldiers. What remained of their liquefied eyes was running down their cheeks, their faces and mouths so blistered they were closed. They were blind and thirsty, begging for water. She produced some water which, due to their swollen lips, had to be consumed through a straw made from a reed collected from the bank of the river. The day before the bombing of Nagasaki, American bombers dropped leaflets on the city declaring that the following day 
the city would be reduced to ashes. The bomb detonated at 11.02, above a tennis court, almost two miles from the intended target. The Urkami Valley shielded much of Nagasaki from the blast, meaning that despite being a larger bomb, the effects at Nagasaki were less disastrous, but the survivors' stories are just as harrowing. Emergency medical centers were established in any large halls available, such as schools, but wartime shortages meant many could not access the treatment they required. One survivor from Nagasaki recalls his father having his feet amputated with a carpenter's saw, quickly dying from complications of the surgery. His mother died very soon after from extreme radiation poisoning. Another survivor, Miss Reiko Hara, had just left school when the bomb detonated. She and her family were shielded from the blast by Mount Konpira, but those on the other side were not so lucky. Refugees fled to the safe side of the mountain. Many of them had lost their eyes. Their hair was burnt and falling out, their clothing had burnt away, and their bodies were covered in terrible burns and blisters. The Aftermath The suffering would continue to grow over the following months. Those who were seemingly unscathed from the blast started to fall ill, weak from radiation exposure. Many who required medical assistance were unable to access it, left to slowly die from infection and disease. Access to food was also a worry for many. Japan was already struggling to feed both its army and civilian population, having been at war since 1937. The nuclear blasts only worsened this, as farms surrounding the bomb sites had their crops destroyed and soil contaminated and the destruction of railways and bridges made transporting food to these areas incredibly difficult. By 1946, an average citizen only ate 800 calories per day, down from 2,000 calories in 1941. The unlucky ones suffered enough radiation to kill them, but not instantly. The sickness started much like any other, with nausea, lack of energy, headache, and inability to eat. Weeks later, stem cells within the bones marrow and gastrointestinal tract are dying. In the final stages, the victims suffered extreme nausea and diarrhea, anorexia, nervousness and confusion, and intense burning sensations. Internal bleeding occurs all over the body, usually starting at the gums, ears, or eyes. This manifested as bruise-like markings all over the body, as veins perforated and bled under the skin. Necrosis also occurred in severe cases, where previously healthy flesh died and turned black, slowly rotting away. The primary causes of death were infection due to low white blood cell count or radiation-induced vasculopathy, a sudden bleed on the brain. The death was slow and painful, with the victim's body slowly but surely shutting down from the inside out as cells died and organs became unable to operate effectively. Those who survived their burns often suffered keloid scars, an extreme form of scarring. These tumor-like scars were harmless in themselves, but painful and could be debilitating if present in the wrong places. People who suffered burns to their hands often found themselves crippled as the large scars formed, turning their hands into useless, claw-like appendages. Keloids on the knees or elbows could also cause disability, as joints become incredibly difficult to move. Invisible scars also formed as people suffered the mental trauma of experiencing such destruction, the loss of family, friends, and their homes. Kiyoshi Tanimoto was a Christian minister who, when running through the city in search of his family, was forced to ignore the cries for help from those stuck in the rubble. The thought that he had abandoned those who called for his help haunted him for the rest of his life, eventually motivating him to dedicate himself to helping survivors, especially children. After the explosion over Hiroshima on August 6th, up to 6,500 children were orphaned instantly, left to fend for themselves in the husks of their once peaceful and happy city. Some of those children were sent to live in often unhappy orphanages, while others lived on the streets. Orphans of the Atom Bomb Hijiyama Elementary School became a center for lost and orphaned children mainly young ones. The center was understaffed, with many of the workers being teachers. The young children suffered severe diarrhea. Some could call out to be taken to the toilet, while others, too sick, just soiled themselves in their sleep. By morning, the blankets and mosquito nets were often heavily soiled with bloody feces. The children also suffered flashbacks and mental anguish, unable to forget their harrowing experiences. Schoolteacher 
Yoshitomatsu, tells of children waking in the night, screaming fire, or the kitchens burning. Some even became incensed at the sight of the burning rice cooker as they ran about the room screaming and crying. Parents arrived day after day looking for their lost children. Some were reunited, but for many, their parents never came. The diarrhea and anemia caused the children to grow thinner every day until they died. Many died without their names ever being known. They were cremated and buried in the schoolyard, and hungry dogs prowled around the premises, rummaging through what remained. The children forced to fend for themselves in the streets camped at the Hiroshima station. They earned their meager living by shining shoes and providing other small services. They found ample customers amongst the new American occupation troops. These children were often shunned from wider Japanese society, as rumors spread that they were diseased and contagious. Starvation forced many of these children into petty criminality. They formed gangs of five or six, robbing female and elderly street vendors. One child would steal an item and run, causing the vendor to chase him. And while the stall was unsupervised, the other children would take anything they could carry. Smaller children were at the mercy of larger and older boys who would even steal food straight from their mouths, grabbing their necks to prevent them from swallowing. Children too afraid or weak to steal resorted to eating discarded newspapers, crumpling the pages into a ball and washing them down with water. The paper would supply no useful nutrients, but it would at least soften their pangs of hunger. Amidst the instability, Yakuza gangsters flooded into the cities, taking advantage of the frail situation. They provided orphans with a roof to sleep under and a tatami mat, but expected work in return. Children were to produce counterfeit alcohol, mixing industrial alcohol with water and selling it on the street for 10 yen. They also produced reconstructed cigarettes produced from collecting the discarded cigarette butts of American soldiers. They were used as drug dealers, selling methamphetamine, and were often addicts themselves. Thousands of survivors are still alive, and they bear both the mental and physical scars of their ordeal. Many have told their stories in hopes that their tales of brutality prevent the same thing from ever happening again. As horrific as their experiences may be, there are still nine nations that possess nuclear weapons, and these weapons are enormously more powerful and destructive than those dropped on Japan. The nuclear bomb has changed the face of war forever. In the eternal words of Einstein, mankind invented the atomic bomb, but no mouse would ever construct a mousetrap.